Well, welcome everybody. My name is Jeremy Grono, and this is The Power of Our Story, and I am leading a study through the book of Matthew. And today we're picking up on chapter three in our study, and uh, we're going to see Matthew is going to introduce a new character in this story, and uh, it should have a familiar story in context to it. At least that's what he's alluding to here. And in order for me to help you guys get this picture, I'm actually going to start on the last chapter of the Old Testament. So where we're going to pick up from is going to be uh, Malachi chapter four. So this is the very last chapter of the Old Testament. So I'll be reading here from verse one, the great day of the Lord. For behold, the day is coming, burning like an oven, when all the arrogant and all the evildoers will be stubble. The day that is coming shall set them ablaze, says the Lord of hosts, so that it will leave them neither root nor branch. Remember that, neither root nor branch. But for you who fear the name, the sun of righteousness shall rise with healing in its wings. You shall go out leaping like calves from the stall, and you shall tread down the wicked, for they will be ashes under the soles of your feet. On that day when I act, says the Lord of hosts, remember the law of my servant Moses, the statutes and rules that I commanded him at Herob for all Israel. Behold, I will send you Elijah the prophet. I'm going to say that one more time so we remember it. Behold, I will send you Elijah the prophet before the great and awesome day of the Lord comes. And he will turn the hearts of their fathers to their children and the hearts of their children to their fathers, lest I come and strike the land with a decree of utter destruction. Okay, so I'm going to take a pause there. So again, that was the last chapter of the Old Testament. And what Matthew is going to do um, is he's going to tie this new character on the scene to that very chapter. There was about 400 years between when that chapter was written until when this story is actually happening. And so Matthew is going to introduce a new character, John the Baptist. And I'll, we'll talk about after I read this first part of chapter three, how those two stories relate. So picking up from chapter three of Matthew verse one, uh, the, the title of this is John the Baptist prepares the way. In those days, John the Baptist came preaching in the wilderness of Judea, repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. For this is he who was spoken of by the prophet Isaiah when he said, the voice of one crying in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord, make his path straight. Now John wore a garment of camel's hair and a leather belt around his waist, and his food was locusts and wild honey. Then Jerusalem and all Judea and all the region about the Jordan were going out to him, and they were baptized by him in the Jordan River, confessing their sins. But when he saw many of the Pharisees and the Sadducees coming to his baptism, he said to them, you brood of vipers, who warns you to flee from the wrath that is to come? Bear fruit in keeping with repentance, and do not presume to say to yourselves, We have Abraham as our father. For I tell you, God is able from these very stones to raise up children for Abraham. Even now the axe is laid to the root of the trees. I'll say that again. Even now the axe is laid to the root of the trees. He's linking that to that Malachi scripture. Um, every tree, therefore, that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. I baptize you with water for repentance, but he who is coming after me is mightier than I, whose sandals I'm not worthy to carry. I will baptize you, or excuse me, he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire, his winnowing fork in his hand and he will clear the threshing floor and gather his wheat into the barn, but the chaff you will burn with unquenchable fire. All right, we'll take a break there. So the role of John the Baptist is to signify a turning point here from the Old Testament to the New Testament. John the Baptist is actually the last prophet. 
So um, how I envision this is what Matthew is trying to allude to here is there's been this relay race for thousands of years. There's been, um, you know, different periods of uh, the kingdom of Israel uh, from judges to kings to prophets, all handing this baton one after another, carrying the word of God and proclaiming the word of God. And here we see this last handoff to the baton to John the Baptist. And what we're going to see here is John is actually going to hand this baton off to Jesus. And it's not that Jesus is going to run the same race that everybody else has been running. He's going to just go to the podium and take first place. And uh, so it's pretty cool. Um, the other thing that Matthew is doing is he's um, bridging the Old Testament to the New Testament. And he he is, John the Baptist is the forerunner to the Messiah. So he is fulfilling prophecy. He's fulfilling Isaiah 40, which you heard, a voice of one calling out in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord, make straight the paths for him. So John is fulfilling that prophecy. And like I said, Malachi, where he says, I will send you Elijah the prophet before the great and awesome day of the Lord. So in comparison here, Elijah in John the Baptist ministry, it's not, John's not just trying to throw in some random characteristics about him that he's got clothes made out of camel hair and he likes to eat locusts and, and honey. It, yes, that's kind of funny, but at the same time, he's trying to link those two characters. And, um, I'm going to pull up some references to scripture. Later on, we'll read in Matthew 17. Um, this is an interaction between Jesus and his disciples. I'll, I'll read this, Matthew 17, verse 10 through 13. And the, and the disciples asked him, then why do the scribes say that first Elijah must come? And Jesus answered them, Elijah does come and he will, will restore all things. But I tell you that Elijah has already come. And they did not recognize him, but did to him whatever they pleased. So also the Son of Man will certainly suffer at their hands. Then the disciples understood that he was speaking to them about John the Baptist. So it's not that John the Baptist is a reincarnation of Elijah. He is walking in the same prophecy and in the same spirit of Elijah. And so here I wrote down a few comparisons so that way we could understand this first um they're both prophets and they're calling israel to repent that's what elijah's ministry was about john the baptist had the same ministry they were both voices in the wilderness urging people to return to god and that their proclaiming message was repentance in a return to god first kings 18 you hear elijah um, challenging the israelites to turn away from Baal, quit worshiping Baal, and go back to Yahweh. Here we see John the Baptist called for repentance to return to the Messiah, return to God. Excuse me, let me get a sip of water. In the same way, uh, Elijah and John, they have conflicts with the rulers of their time. So for Elijah... He was opposed by King Ahab and Queen Jezebel, who should be some familiar characters. For, for John, we'll see as we continue reading, it was Herod Antipas, and uh, which eventually leads to John's death. Spoiler alert. Um, uh, but they both, like I said, they both have simple lifestyles. They were both man, men of the wilderness. You hear about um, Elijah was a rugged man of the wilderness. And then you see John the Baptist, he's got clothes of camel hair, which can't, can't be comfortable at all. That's got to be some pretty itchy clothes. I would, I would think, and you hear him eating locusts and honey and I can't imagine that, but Hey, um, it, it's drawing the imagery there to, to connect those two figures. Uh, one of the most important things is both of these characters are anointing and empowering leaders. For Elijah, he anoints Elisha. And then you see um, coming up as we continue to read, John the Baptist is going to anoint Jesus. Um, they're also both transition figures. So Elijah 
was, uh, his ministry was marked by a significant period where um, he was transitioning Israel to the new prophet Elijah. Elijah himself is one of the only figures in the Bible. Um, him and Enoch are the two figures in the Bible that don't die. So uh, if if you've read about Enoch in the book of Genesis, he was, and then he was taken up into heaven in the genealogy. And then the same with Elijah, he was taken up into heaven and he he actually never died. And a lot of people think these are the two figures in, in Revelation that are going to be coming back in the end times to proclaim the kingdom of God in Israel. But that's for another time and another day. Um, so that's all I have about John the Baptist. I was trying to connect those two figures. Just wanted to open up to, to you, Sarah, and Bia, see if you guys had any questions about that, that first part that we read there. And then we'll continue on. okay okay we'll continue cool all right so picking up from um, matthew chapter 3 verse 13 the baptism of jesus then jesus came from galilee to the jordan to john to be baptized by him john would have prevented him saying i need you or excuse me i need to be baptized by you and do you come to me? But Jesus said to him, Let it be so now, for thus it is fitting for us to fulfill all righteousness. Then John consented. And when Jesus was baptized, immediately he went up from the water, and behold, the heavens were opened up to him. And he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and come and rest on him. And behold, a voice from heaven said, This is my beloved Son with whom I'm well pleased. I'm going to read that part again because I want to see if, if we can pick that up. And he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and coming to rest on him. And behold, a voice from heaven said, This is my beloved Son with whom I'm well pleased. This is the first image of the Trinity that the New Testament presents. So you have... Let's envision this. You have Jesus in the Jordan River. The heavens open up. The Holy Spirit is descending like a dove. And then there's another voice in heaven that's saying, this is my beloved son with whom I'm well pleased. So you see three persons right here in this part of chapter three. This is the first presentation of the Trinity, which is pretty amazing. So... um let me look, pull up my notes here and see what else I wanted to talk about. Okay, explicit meaning Jesus is baptized by John for repentance. Uh, excuse me, not for repentance because Jesus is sinless. So this isn't something where Jesus was going to be um, washed of his sins, but he was there to fulfill righteousness. This really is, like we talked about earlier, this is the beginning of Jesus's public ministry. And so... Um, this is the first time where you see the Trinity, you see the confirmation from God in heaven that this is my anointed one. This is the son with whom I'm well pleased. He is the one that I'm trusting in to save the world. So I just think it's amazing that, um, that you see this coming, um, in this foundation that's set the very beginning. This actually concludes the introduction of Matthew, like I talked about in previous chapters, the first three chapters are the introduction. So it's introducing Jesus, who he is, his lineage, his background. And then next week, chapter four is the beginning of the first discourse. So with this new kingdom, really this new king that has arrived, what does that mean? What is he teaching? How do we be a part of that kingdom? That's where we'll pick up next week. But you see first here a confirmation of this is the king. Jesus is the king. Here's the beginning of his ministry. Pay attention. Um, the other thing that the Jordan River should symbolize and should draw imagery for us is the reason John is baptizing in the, in the Jordan is the historical significance here. This is the, the boundary from Israel that they crossed into the promised land. And so it's not a coincidence. This is basically saying, here is the king that's going to lead us to the new promised land. This is an echo back to Genesis of the new creation 
And you see Jesus is here um, really announcing this new kingdom in the new creation. And we're invited to be a part of that. So with that said, those are my notes, and that's the completion of Matthew chapter 3. Love to open it up to you guys and have a little further discussion. I'm sorry, Baya, you, you're okay. muted. Sorry, thank you. Um, I like how you presented the first time we see the Trinity. Um, and I think it's, uh, it's really the spiritual rim, uh, the heaven crashing into earth. Um, and uh, the, the first thing that came to my mind when you were talking about that is like, yes, that's the first time we see. But also, uh, it made me think about um, us because the first thing that came in my mind was uh, um, uh, when uh, uh, Jacob was running away and he was sleeping on the on the rock in the desert, and then he had this uh, dream of uh, a ladder and an uh, angel coming up and down. He had that vision of the the uh, the um, the merging um, and the open uh, openness of uh, um, God opening a way, you know what I mean? For him, when he was in the in his complete scene, and so that's what came in my mind because of like this this moment in the in the in the Jordan River is God crashing into our scene and opening that door for reconciliation. Other than what you said about the 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 um, the first time we see the Trinity. Oh, that's great. That's great. By yeah, that's a that's a great example. This is. Uh, it's so amazing because um, there's so much historical evidence around Jesus, but there's this myth, it's almost like this mythology around him as well. And you see this unification, like you're talking about, of the spiritual realm and the physical realm are coming together right here. So I love that you called that out. That's that's such a powerful imagery there. And uh, I love I love that part of, of the Old Testament as well. <clears throat> 